people are here to do some killing. This, the, <laughs> killing characters 101 is, is the subject of this panel. Uh, the, the description, uh, you know, the, the description goes, the decision to kill a character is fraught, as it should be, to which I say sometimes, and often tied to thematic elements, audience, audience expectations of genre, and concerns around representation. Panelists will, perhaps, deconstruct stories that handle these issues well or poorly and discuss their own challenges in making character deaths as meaningful as their lives. Well, um, what, what I, the way I would like to actually start is to have, uh, we'll, we'll go down, we'll start with Robert, I want to have everyone, each panelist introduce themselves and uh, you know, succinctly say who you are and I would like at the end of your introduction to discuss how you contributed to the death of at least one character. <laughs> <laughs> and, all right, Robert, Robert, you first. How I contributed to it? Because, I mean... Now, introduce yourself all? first. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Contribution. Yeah. <laughs> it was a very basic contribution. I decided it. Right. I it. right, right. Hi, I'm Robert Reddick. I've been writing epic fantasy for about the last 15 years, off and on. Um, and I'm in the middle of my second series. Uh, my first one was a uh, young adult nautical, crazy, world-spanning adventure with uh, hundreds of characters, I think 72 with names uh, that you got to know, and quite a few of those did die. Um, and uh, I, I also have a bright background in international development and uh, social and environmental justice, um, so I'm not bloodthirsty. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I do want to answer your question, but it seems so self. I mean, how I, you mean you want me to you, describe it in death? You, or? However you want to. Okay. I'm, I'm not well, going to force anyone to do anything that we love. I mean, I thought I'd come back to this later on in the show, sure. but I'll just say there have been there have been a lot of deaths, and I feel them still because I, I'm a character guy, I guess, and I, they, they, they all hurt. Charlie. Hey, I'm Charlie. Uh, I'm a writer, researcher, and author out of West Philadelphia. Um, my last big project was a study on Schadenfreude and the uh, epic uh, beast tale Eisengrimus, and comparing that to Wiley Coyote, making a very <laughs> interesting <laughs> argument for that. Uh, which leads me to uh, I'm going to choose to interpret the second clause in your question. Sure. As favorite or most memorable death I've been involved in in the realm of fiction, that might be that works. Uh, sticking the devil in a bolt of frozen lightning. So that was fun. <laughs> so Charlie, by the way, confessed when, when, when he came up here that this is his first ever panel. <laughs> 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 Welcome. You, you will contribute much, I am sure. See, in the mainstream fiction, they just look at <laughs> in this group, it's like, hey, yeah, girl, okay, well, we'll have the sacrifice tonight. And you're the newbie, you're going on the table. <laughs> no, no, but maybe. Karen? Hi, um, I've had over 100 stories published. My ninth book just came out uh, in December. Uh, I've won a couple of awards. And I write literary horror, fantasy, but mostly off-beat weird kind of stuff. Um, we had a little bit of a preliminary discussion. I, I, I very firmly am against violence, gratuitous violence and unnecessary killing. And but it's I, those gratuitous and unnecessary that are so crucial. I know. Well, <laughs> the weird thing is because I, I fight myself sometimes on uh, not using violence as a very casual, easy way out in the plot. So, I started a story in which the character just sort of, I don't know how it happened, but I happened to kill my ex. And then, I'm, you know, I'm really against this kind of gratuitous violence. Um, so what happened was the ex, even though he was killed, refused to die uh, as a way of getting me out of my own problem of not wanting to go around killing characters needlessly. So that's my favorite so far. Anyway, anyway. <laughs> Uh, my name is Mary Newman. I'm an editor at Candlewood Press, which means that I work on children's and young adult, mostly on middle grade and young adult novels. 
Um, and so it, as an editor, I feel like I've done less contributing to the deaths themselves and publishing <coughs> the deaths so that they're prettier. <laughs> the, and I also, I have, I feel like I've, so far I have done more pulling authors back from killing quite so many characters than I have pushing them over the edge to kill them. People, though, there have been some things that I have declined, in part because way too many characters survive this. <laughs> Not realistic. Uh, and, but you've kind of given me an opportunity, so I'm going to tell one of my favorite candlelight editorial stories, even though it's not me. It was slightly before sure. my time. Uh, there is a picture book for ages, I believe we say four to eight, uh, called I Want My Hat Back, <laughs> uh, which is about a bear whose hat has gone missing, um, and eventually he realizes that it has been taken by a rabbit. Um, and we see him encounter the rabbit, and at the end, somebody comes, a, a squirrel comes and asks him, have you seen a rabbit? He says, no, I haven't seen any rabbits anywhere. I would never eat a rabbit. Stop asking me questions. Uh, which almost perfectly mimics what the rabbit wearing the hat said when asked, have you seen my hat? Uh, and at the end, you see the bear just sitting there. And I am told that when this book was on submission, almost every editor at every house said, I love it, but we've got to see the rabbit in the end papers or something so we know that he didn't actually eat the rabbit. <laughs> and the candlebook editor said, I need to never see that rabbit again. <laughs> Darn. So, sometimes you gotta let the character not die, and sometimes you gotta commit to that death. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll finish off with myself. Um, I am the publisher of, with, with my wife Anita, of Mythic Delirium Books, uh, and I'm also an editor, and I am also a, I'm also a writer, uh, and so you know I have, I have both dealt with, as you mentioned, making deaths prettier or sometimes less pretty, depending on what I felt the story might need. Uh, for for some of the the publications that I've overseen, like the Clockwork. Phoenix anthologies uh, or uh, books that we publish. And uh, I, as a writer, tend to go very dark. So uh, when I was trying to think about how to answer my own question, you know, what, what, uh, what deaths have I contributed to? You know, I was thinking in terms of an author. And my first answer was, well, of course, quite a lot. But then I realized. Uh, for example, I have I have a, a novella called The Quilt Maker. That's a horror novella, and uh, I introduce somewhere between fifteen and twenty characters in the course of this story, and and almost none of them make it out, but almost none of them die because uh, you for some horror. Death isn't horrible enough. <laughs> so, 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 and and so, I've 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 had to contemplate preparing for this panel how how I go for the fate worse than death a lot in my own fiction, uh, and and I guess later if the opportunity comes up I can discuss why that is. Um, but what I'd like to do to kind of not hog the entire panel is ask a question. Um, a general question about what purpose does, can, or should, or does the death of a character serve in a story? And I'm going to start with Miriam this time. Okay. Uh, it does depend a lot on the story. So a couple of the books that I've worked on have been murder mysteries. And so very obviously, those deaths serve to catalyze the story. You can't have a murder mystery. You can have other mysteries without real dying, but you can't have a murder mystery without some murder. <laughs> and so yeah, those are kind of catalyzing deaths. And there are also 
So in part, because I work on middle grade and YA, there's also the freeing gap. Uh, you know, you have things like, you know, every Red Bull book, the mentor dies <laughs> about a quarter of the way through. Because the mentor has to get the character to a certain point and then get gone so that the character can go on and have their adventure. And so that's, it's not quite a catalyzing death, but it's freeing up the character to come into their own. Uh, and, and then I'd say there's, kind of, there's the cathartic death, which is usually comes more towards the end of the book. And that's the things have been built up and built up and built up. And that's the final thing that lets us come back down again. That was an excellent answer. Thank right? you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what else is left, actually. What's the question exactly? Um, uh, what purpose what, what purpose can or should a death a character's death serve? So, I, I guess that for And you can you can make it personal if you want. Yeah, no, I'm trying to think of why I kill people in my stories. <laughs> I mean certainly there's the the like a murder mystery, there's the death you need in order for the plot to go forward. Um, there's also a certain satisfaction you take in killing certain characters because they represent something to you that you happen to dislike or you want revenge on somebody. Uh, for one example, I had a long, long time ago a boss who was uh, harassing me. And there was no greater satisfaction than turning this into a story and killing him at the end. <laughs> and I, I can't do this in real life, but I can do it in a story. So in certain stories, there's a satisfaction to you as the writer that the reader won't necessarily get, but you get. Mm -hmm. um, and Sometimes then, the, the reader can too. If it's you like pick up something because there's a sort of universality of being stalked if you're a woman. Yeah, yeah, that or you can pick up on. One uh, of the murder mysteries I worked on, uh, there's a character who is abusive and you know, the, the domineering man, and he gets saved by the main character, and she's solved the mystery, and you have to be happy for solving the mystery, and then you're so happy when he dies anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I guess the big one is most of the time that I have trouble with is killing characters for the plot in order to get the plot to move forward, or as, the, as they say, to up the stakes. And the, it's the upping the stakes deaths that bother me the most because I think there are a great many things other than death that are horrific. Um, being banished, being separated from people you love, losing uh, your sense of reality. I mean, there's so many things that up the stakes without resorting to sort of the easiest thing, which is death. I love that you mentioned that because because that's actually what I was about to bring up, but in like a positive way. <laughs> but uh, ju just certainly in, well, but I, 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 can, I, can, I, I can express the dark side of that too. Just, uh, something that you, you, you didn't mention and Karen just did, and, and something that I've done as a horror writer is you know, is, 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 is the thing where you start with a large cast of characters and the threat that is the, the, the threat that is the antagonist of the story, you know, uh, starts eliminating some of the characters as it's kind of bearing down on whoever you've chosen as the main character. And that is a way of upping the stakes. And I do agree with you that, I, I do agree with you that that is not always the way that it should be. And since I mentioned horror in particular, you know, horror films have a particularly egregious formula yes, yes. For, 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 how, for, for how that process is carried out. You know, oftentimes, you know, it's, you know, a minority character will be killed early on, or, uh, uh, or, or, or it's tied, or it's tied to sexual, or it's tied to sexual exploits or something like that. That's horrendously tiresome. If, 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 you're, if you're planning to do that in a story, please don't do that for me. But also, but, if, yeah. if I may, the thing sure. that really bothers me about that is all the things you just mentioned actually give you pleasure. And I think that it gives pleasure to, that's why those movies are successful. Slasher and all these movies where... Seeing those particular stereotypes get killed. Yeah, one after the other. Right. I, I think that 
That, that's a worst case scenario, but it's also something that's certainly true. Awful but accurate. What did I say? Why is everyone winning? <laughs> no, someone's trying to get in, I think. Okay. A slasher. Oh. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, that's a good this is how it begins. Right. <laughs> well, you are correct that that you you are you are correct that fans fans of horror, you know, fans fans of fans of horror are looking for characters to be off in creative ways. That is part of the team. Uh, and um, that going into that topic would keep me from getting to Charlie, so I'm not going to jump into that just yet. I'm going to pass the topic. Yeah, hi. Sure. I'll be brief, but I wanted to uh, oh, briefly elaborate or riff off of your discussion of fate worse than death, right? So this is a, a common trope in fantasy and fiction. I think Rowling has it in. Harry Potter, Dumbledore is talking to Harry. You know, the, the weakness that Voldemort has isn't his wild inability to coordinate logistics, although he has that too. Yes. It's that he can't conceive of anything that could possibly worse than death. Literally anything is preferable to dying, and that makes him like a child in some ways. And the, you know, it's right at the end of the book, um, at least for me, I left that a little late. Right? <laughs> um, so there's worse than death, but For death to matter, if we're just going to look at like folk tales or how it's woven into the structure, there's sort of the, you, you, I think your phrase was a catalyst insight? Yeah. Catalyst? Catalyzing. Catalyzing, thank you. That's so much better than going catalyst. Um, death, but I think the, my favorite example of that is Epic of Gilgamesh, right? You know, it's uh, basically a buddy cop myth set in Sumeria where Gilgamesh is king of everything, and the gods don't like that, and they gang do. They fight, become basically buddy cops, go and kill a seemingly unkillable guardian of a cedar forest, takes its equivalent of, you know, vast wealth back to Earth. And you're like, all right, cool, roll credits. Oh no, Gilgamesh is not done making what bad decisions. Does <laughs> <laughs> tell them to stop? They, try. they just need yeah. to stop. Yeah, just yeah. stop. Not so, Gilgamesh, for reasons best known only to him, pisses off the god, goddess of both love and war, which should tell you everything you need to know about this particular goddess. Uh, she runs up into the heavens and has them throw down a creature called the Bull of Heaven, and, and Kadu and Gilgamesh do the Bash Brothers things they're good at. But about a week later, um, and Kadu catches plague and dies. This is like a huge moment for Gilgamesh to actually have the reality of death sink into him. Like all the people he killed before he met Enkidu, Humbaba, the cedar giant, they don't really register for him. And it triggers his whole search for immortality, right? That's, this is like the oldest example of a catalyzing death I can think of off the top of my head without my, my notes or the internet. So yeah, death needs to matter. You can't, I, I think that it's, it's really easy to overdraw the death bank in fiction. So don't do it. If you have any other option. And that was a no way brief, but please. No. Well, it's, it's hard to be real brief about this. Um, it, because it's a very big question. You know, what, what purpose in a certain story? I mean, I was thinking about it more or less in, in terms of slots it falls into, in my thinking, anyway. I mean, there's what a death means for the writer in the moment of writing it. There's what it means for the character going through it, or the characters who care about the character who dies. And that's another thing. There's what that death may mean for the larger culture created or explored in the story. Because death is, does not have a universal meaning. I'm just reading about death for the Egyptians in the first, second, third dynasties. Oh my God, I thought I knew what death meant to people. No, <laughs> you know, um, just this morning. And then there's what it means for the story 
apart from that in more of a like, functional sense. But um, maybe one way to get closer to answering that question is to think of some of the things that, you know, to, to sort of wipe off the chalkboard some of the things we want to avoid. I think we have to hit on this. But like, one of the things you often will be frustrated to encounter is, you know, a death that just feels like, wrap this shit up already. You know, this is, you know we got we to gotta bring this story in for a landing, so start killing people. And then, the everyone dies. yeah, yeah, or, or even worse, <laughs> things are getting slow to kill someone. I mean, I thought, I, I admired aesthetically in, in several ways uh, Blade Runner 2049, but every time it got slow, they just killed another woman. And it was atrocious when I reflected on it. Um, and uh, so, I mean, every death that matters ought to have a feeling like it isn't a type, but it is a it is sui generis. It is a thing in itself that you have to, you know, that's ripped out of you, you know. And uh, otherwise, you've got red shoes. You know, or, 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 or women in refrigerators. Women yeah. in refrigerators. Right. Do, do folks know what that means? I don't know. Red shirts, I know. So women in refrigerators, uh, the phrase comes out of comic books. I don't remember the uh, canonical one. In Green which, Lantern. They, Green Lantern. Uh, in which he comes home to find his girlfriend dead and stuffed in his refrigerator. Um, and it is the death usually of a woman, um, not always. Sometimes it's a queer person, sometimes it's a person of color, but usually it's a woman who gets killed off in order to spur the hero on to <coughs> his de destiny by which he starts out by going to find out who killed his girl and get his revenge. Okay, so the, uh, basically a genesis for a murder mystery type thing. Or uh, revenge. No, it's revenge. Revenge. It's not a revenge story. It's not, a, it's not as sophisticated as a murder yeah. mystery. Yeah. Okay. yeah, well, you know, Cat, Cat, uh, Cat Valenti has a, a, a book that riffs on this called The Refrigerator Monologues. <laughs> 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 Let me toss out um, just to whoever wants to feel it, and we'll go from there. What what might you point to in your reading as an example of a character death done well? <coughs> oh, I don't want to watch the death of Ursula. Mm -hmm. um, Ursula Iguaran, the grandmother and matriarch, of, really of the whole arc of the story, but um, she seems to be a little in the background because you're in a uh, kind of a machista set at the beginning. But by the time you're 50 pages into it, you know, you've gone through, you know, madness of every conceivable order of human behavior, just in the first 50 pages out of 500, 600 records. And things just keep getting worse, and she's there. She's, she's a voice of sanity. She's like this grounding rock in this ever faster kaleidoscope of madness around this fictional town, and she's always there, and she's always understated, and she's always cleaning up people's messes and she's and she's you know when her when her son becomes a tin pot dictator and is killing everyone left right and center she gets out a, a buggy whip and chases him around the town and says i dare you to kill me bastard yeah, yeah, yeah. until he's cowering in the corner and, and quivering and she's such an amazing hero and she lives and lives and lives when everybody's dying people die at five years old they die at 25 years old she lives to be like 109 or something like that and it's this slow burn you know, she, she gets quieter and smaller, and you just start saying, no, Ursula, she's still there, right? She's not gone. And then you'll see her for a moment, and she, and she gets, you know, a little more retracted in the story, and then finally, she's, um, you know, because it's magical realism, they think she's dead, and they start carrying her body around, and she's saying, no, I'm still here, I'm alive, and no one can hear her. And, and then when she finally passes, it's just, it's so epical. It's just, you just feel, now there's no sanity left in the universe. No one can help us. It's so well done. Still brings chills.
And what was that series? A hundred years of solitude, Garcia Marquez. And this sort of reminds me of the incredible shrinking man. <laughs> yeah. Just okay. getting smaller and smaller. Yeah. Anyone else want to pick that one? Yeah. I mean, you, I see you, you've got your props in front of you. Uh, it's, it's it's for this? Really, more things not to forget when I'm speaking. Okay. Um, this is less conventional, I guess, but there's a description in one of Octavio Paz's poems. He writes very short poem, very efficient. And he's writing about the raising of a Central American town during the 80s. And this one line, or one series of lines stood out to me, which is, the villagers ran out and hid in the ditches and strangled their dogs so the barking wouldn't give them away <laughs> while people were burning their village. And that line in particular is, beautifully done, it sets a tone, and it, you know, it levels your expectations for the rest of the poem and what this book of poetry is going to be. Um, and so, you know, it's not really fiction, not what we're here to talk about, but if you want to set a tone or implant <coughs> memory into a reading, then that, that is a hell of a way to do it. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily have to be a human death, I would point out. So I would also add, um, MK, in M.K. Jamison's Broken Earth trilogy, um, which there are many, many deaths, uh, but the two in particular that came to mind, there are two instances of children killed by parents. Um, and they are fairly directly in contrast with each other. Uh, they are both the main characters, children, and she kills one of them kill the other and one of the deaths is a violent angry act and the other one is she feels she is saving her child from a fate worse than death and which again that keeps coming up right. uh, and that idea of death from lashing out versus death of desperation versus sacrifice in a way. Um, and I, in general, I think that Nora is brilliant at everything she does, but uh, it's particularly uh, disturbingly well done. <laughs> what was the question? I, yeah, I, I keep going on a track and say no. Everyone else is oh. talking about so far away from what I was thinking that I must have. Well, well my, what, I, what I tossed out was yeah. you know an, an example of an example of the character that done well. Okay. Now I'm going to go with something that's way different from go what other it. people have been talking about, which is Logan's Run. When you turn 30, <laughs> <laughs> that impresses me as a great death. Right. Right. Let's. Very, very sweeping. Yes. Ups, ups, ups the stakes for sure. Um, I'm, I'm going to, for my examples, I'm going, I'm going to cheat twice, so I'll try and make it quick. Um, because we keep coming back to the fate worse than death. A, a story that I read, probably when I was way too young to have read it, that ended up having a profound uh, impact on me. Uh, was I Have No Mouth and I'm a Scream by Marlon Ellis. And uh, if, has, does anyone mind me spoiling that story in order to talk about it? Okay. Um, the, you know, essentially, you, you, have, you have five characters who are trapped inside this computer that is able, that is, has gone, uh, something has gone wrong with it. And it is this horrific sadist sort of Satan type being, and it keeps kind of it keeps torturing these last five people left alive. It's, it's they are its prisoner, and it it has this undying hatred for humanity, and it and it keeps them alive to take it out on them. It's killed everyone on Earth but those five. Yeah, and at the very end, <laughs> at, at 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 the very end, the narrator of the story sort of sort of catches the ca catches the computer off guard and and kills the other four people you know, and it's essentially it's mercy killings when he does it and, and it frees them 
and then, uh, but he, he, the computer stops him before he can kill himself and transforms his body so that he's incapable of, 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 of performing violence on himself. And that's where the title comes from, I Have No Mouth and I'm a Scream. Uh, and so, so, you know, that scenario, you know, stuck with me at an early age, and I think it keeps, I, I think, I think elements of it keep coming out in my own work. Um, shifting over uh, to my editor and publisher side, uh, Mythic Delirium's most recent release is, is by an author called uh, Barbara Krasnoff. No, she's in the room. You're not in the room, are you, Barbara? Okay. <laughs> uh, called the, the History of Soul 2065. And it is, a, it, is a, it is a very different book from the kind of book that I write. Uh, it's very magical realist. It is about, uh, it is about uh, two Jewish families who uh, their, their destinies become intertwined in these kind of, in these kind of hard to describe ways that, that incorporate magic and, and time travel and, and a number of other elements. And, she handles death very differently in her stories from what I do. She does it extremely well. Um, and she was a Nebula Award finalist for a story called Sabbath Wine, which is in this book. And um, in that story, in, 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 the, in that story, a, uh, a, a, a Jewish, um, a, a, it's set in the 20s during Prohibition, and uh, a, a Jewish man who has lost his faith uh, has been asked by his young daughter to 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 uh, hold a to to hold a Sabbath dinner for uh, her new friend who is black. Uh, they're both and. He, in order to do this properly, he needs to find the right kosher wine. And it's extremely difficult because it's, it's, uh, it's set in prohibition. And he ends up going to, uh, he, he, he ends up going to the new friend's father, who's a bootlegger, and that's how he's able to acquire it. And then he ends up inviting both the father and son to, uh, to, to, to the dinner. And uh, if you're if you if you're reading it and you're not maybe hip to sort of the, the very subtle speculative fiction signals, you will probably think hmm, this is just like a straightforward story, you know, that you you find you know you 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 find in a, in, in in a lit mag uh, until the reveal at the end that until the reveal at the end that both of the children are ghosts. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's really only the two fathers together eating with the spirits of their children there with them. And, uh, you know, the, the way the deaths came about, you find out you had very much to do with, you know, anti-Semitism and, and racism. And I'm not able to do this justice just de describing it. But, you know, a lot of people have, because I've heard from them, a lot of people finish that story and end up bawling because of the, because of the, the weight of those deaths and what they signify. And that is something that Barbara actually does very well. Uh, you know, she, Jane, Jane, Jane Yolen wrote the introduction to the book and uh, her, in her introduction, you know, she says, I warn you, you're going to ugly cry. <laughs> uh, the History of Soul 2065. And, and that's the way it will also make you cry. Yes. And a beautiful and And people, now that the book is out, I've been getting feedback from people who are like, does this mean the year 2065? And I'll, I'll throw out a spoiler detail, no. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's like a union number. So soul 2065 is all the people who make up the certain soul. So anyway, that was my cheating answer to that. Um, we have about 15 minutes, if I read this right. And I'm sure everybody has things they haven't gotten to yet. 
So I apologize for that. But I want to see if the audience has any questions. Yes? Have you ever, Fred, you want to ask, have you ever um, altered a story because you had intended to kill a character, but you've gotten so attached to that character that you can't bring yourself to, to kill that person? Or you know, do, do you end up going through with it? <laughs> yes and no. I, I have sometimes had plans to kill and uh, reconsidered whether it's the best thing for the story. And sometimes it is, and it's just, and I feel horrible because I don't want to kill it. And sometimes it's not, and it may com complicate the telling and the arc of the story, and it's better for it, I hope. So, yeah, I've changed my mind for sure. I planned a whole novel where a character was dead early on and the character never ended up dying. I'm, I'm going to cheat again. Um, there's another book that I was the editor for. Uh, it's a novel called Latchkey by Nicole Corner Stace. Uh, it's the sequel to her novel, Ark of this Wasp. And this, this is a very wild series if you ever get to try it out. Uh, um, gosh, how can I even describe the Ark of this Wasp? It's, you, you have, so it's, it's so post-apocalyptic that they don't even remember what the apocalypse was or when. Right. That's, that's, that's a very oversimplified way to put it. But the only way that they can figure out what the history of their world is is to capture ghosts and interrogate them. Right. And uh, in her original draft of Latchkey, in her original draft of Latchkey, you know, I can't take credit for this exactly, but in, in her original draft of, of Latchkey, she introduced a very interesting new character and uh, and killed the same character off within like a chapter or two. And I remember giving her feedback to the effect of, you know, I, I really like this character. I kind of wish she would do more with it. Uh, and the, 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 the final version of, the, the final version of Latchkey, you know, still has a pretty grim fate for that character, but she has she has a much more powerful, satisfying arc in terms of what she gets to do and who she gets to interact with, and it and it strengthens the novel overall. And so uh, that is that is a case of an author not so much deciding not to kill the character as deciding well not to kill that character yet <laughs> and let her do some more things. Uh, so, as for whether I've done that, I think, I, I think I'm pretty murderous when it comes to characters. Karen, do you have? I can't think of anything. I, I don't plot far ahead. I'm, I'm more right. of one of those people who I write the story as I go along. So I wouldn't really, I can't really think of anything that would be similar to that. <coughs> Any other questions? I saw you first. What would you say stops a character death from being gratuitous? Because there's obviously a lot of discussion now on top of the media with shows like Game of Thrones and The Walking Dead. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, they drop like flies and half the time it means something and half the time it doesn't. So what would you say is that deciding factor? I, I would say that, I, I, I would say that you could measure that in terms of how, uh, how the other characters in the story itself shift once that character has is, has exited. Uh, if if it's I mean if literally everyone goes on as if it didn't happen, I, w I would consider that as you know unless you know there's some sort of point being made in shaping the story that way, I would consider that to be a pretty spectacular failure. I mean, was, would the character even have been necessary if they made no difference once they were gone? Um, I think that there's a lot about uh, what the reader remembers afterwards. Like, do you remember them? Do you remember their death? Do you remember their death as a thing that happened? Or do you remember their death as something you experienced? And it has to have enough intensity to really, but like when you are thinking about it afterwards, 
that you're not just like, yeah, and then she died, or yeah, and then they came up with this really creative, nasty way to kill her, that you have to be like, oh my god, and then she died. Yeah. I, I think I agree with you. For me, I haven't watched Game of Thrones, so I apologize, because I realize I'm missing many opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> but I think if the death is thrilling, that's gratuitous. If there was any, for instance, if that character has to disappear from the story, fine. Why wasn't it exile? Was the killing of the character or the way the character died in itself more interesting than having that character in the story? So, so Something one, like that. One other thing that I would like to throw out there is we've mostly been talking about violent death. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there is also the question of natural death. Sorry. Of what? Natural death. Okay. Um, and you know, I work on children's in YA, which there are a lot of themes that come up repeatedly in kids in YA because these are these are the things that will help kids get through stuff in their lives. And something that most kids have to deal with at some point is an older relative dying. And even in sci-fi and fantasy, you can get stories where there is a very meaningful, non-violent death. Um, so this one is one that um, I worked on. And it starts with the moon was strange the night that Auntie died. And that is, it, it, you never know Auntie alive. But you know her dead. And you know what she meant to the characters. And knowing what she meant to the characters is what makes her death meaningful. I think there are stories where gratuitous is the point. I don't like them, but they exist and they serve, they serve an audience. Yeah. Um, and if beyond that, if, if we're being, you know, trying to be in some way serious and honest about death when we write about it, I mean, for me, it's a fail if I don't feel anything, if nobody feels anything, then it's gratuitous. Well, I, I just want to add a couple things that I, that I heard. Um, it's, it's interesting how in this day and age, you know, when, when a property, uh, and I guess it happens somewhat with novels too, it definitely happens with movies, when, when a property commits gratuitous death in a bad way, they'll get called out on it. Yeah. Uh, in, in the movie Jurassic World, which is, a, in my opinion, a terrible movie, you know, beyond even this, there's, 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 there's a character that doesn't do very much, but it's kind of seen in a few scenes, and then, and then dies on screen with what's apparently like the most horrific drawn out death in the entire Jurassic Park series. Uh, and it was a woman, and and people got people got very angry about that. And uh, interestingly, the, the the creators the creators you know during <laughs> I feel like maybe they learned the wrong lesson. But, but I read an interview with the creators where they talked about how uh, in putting together the sequel, you know, Fallen World, uh, they they made sure that everyone who died deserved it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, it, it is interesting, Charlie. I think we had this big kind of d informal discussion before this, uh, be be before before this, well before this panel came together. And I think you you brought up a question uh, about you 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 talked you, you talked about, for example, uh, the creators of James Bond and Sherlock Holmes getting sick of their characters and trying to kill them off and essentially being forced to bring them back because of, because of reader outcry. Do you, do you want to run with that? Yeah, I mean, there, there's something to it when you're, you're truly sick of a character, even if they're profitable, they're making you money, your name is now known. And I like said, the James Bond and Sherlock Holmes franchises are going strong now, even though if their authors had their way, they would be interesting little footnotes in literary or entertainment history. Um, it's kind of a cat came back the next day sort of situation, um, which 
you know, is a thorny question of does the audience, once the work is out in the world, matter more than what the author intended, which I can't even begin to answer, but it's an interesting question. I mean, a world without James Bond wouldn't be the worst in the world, <laughs> but I don't see how it's strictly better. So, I mean, we lose a lot of cheese, if nothing else. <laughs> And how many times have any given Marvel character oh, yeah. died? Like, there is a phrase, a Marvel death. This <laughs> refers to a character usually in comics dying and the reader knowing that give it 10 weeks, they'll be back. Be back. Yeah, so, so the death becomes meaningless in a way. Yeah, it's right. like a pause. <laughs> yes. Just put that character on pause. I'll call many of those deaths gratuitous because the reader never buys into but then there's also the, the thing that speculative fiction lets us do where death is not the end of the character. Right. Yeah. I mean, Auntie dies on page one, and she yeah. is there as a character throughout. Right. right. I mean, in beloved Toni Morrison's novel, you know, the death of one of the central, the titular character is like on page four. This, this character is never alive in the book. And yet, the whole book is, she's an active, vital, defining force in the novel. And you know, that's a great thing that we get to do in our, in our play. Right. And, and it doesn't work, you know, in, in I, I, fiction the same way. I mentioned the Ark of the Swaps and Latchkey series. Uh, m several of the characters in, in those books are ghosts. And they've been dead for thousands of years. but. But the ones that are central to the story are from an era are, 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 are from an era of very sophisticated technology and they have force of they have force of personality in their ghostly manifestations such that they can they can produce you know something like they, 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 they can produce technological items like something that heals or something that's a weapon and it will work even though it's technically really from the underworld, and that 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 and, you know that just makes that story go off in a crazy direction. It's wonderful. Yes, sir. <coughs> yeah. Then then the cultural uh, take. Uh, Tim Tingle is a Choctaw storyteller and author. Choctaw all, always. Choc TimTingle.com. He has a series of three books, uh, a three book trilogy actually. Uh, called How He Became a Ghost, which is the story of the Trail of Tears. To understand it, you have to understand that within the Choctaw culture, I, I, I think there are some people who can see and talk with ghosts, and there are some people who, when they become a ghost, can be the ghosts that they see and talk to. And there's a wonderful story. It's, it's for children, but you can it's all ages. Okay. And so with a structure like that, you've got such amazing potential for storytelling. Oh, you yes. in the fiction. It's wonderful. It's one he knows how to weave a story. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there are several cultures that follow that, where the ancestors can become the ones that you communicate with. That the hand in the back there. Yes, thank you. Um, so I was wondering, uh, we, we, we mentioned violent death, we mentioned natural death, and I was curious what you all think are the various benefits or effects of slow death versus sudden death, and how those can impact the story. Well, um, Margot Lanigan's, I don't know if you consider this a slow death, but, but Margot Lanigan's singing My Sister Down is, is just an amazing amazing story and that is a story that is a story about a slow execution in which the the family of the, the family of, of the this this woman is being executed in this culture essentially she's been made to stand in this sort of something that's the equivalent of like quicksand or a tar pit and you know, she will she's being pulled in and she will eventually be pulled completely under and drown, but it takes hours, and so her family can be with her as this happens. And uh, 
And you know, this is you know, this is a story that kind of has it all because you have this horrific death, but then you have this sort of celebration of this character's life that happens with her family present. And it's, it's, it's an amazing experience. Um, now, I don't know if that's what you meant by slow death. I mean, maybe you meant Boba Fett in the Sarlacc, but <laughs> <laughs> that's probably more gratuitous. But, uh, and anyone else have a response to that one? There's always that. Uh, my favorite example is that hellbound train in like 1940 where the devil gives uh, a guy basically a, a one use only time stop. Uh, and the guy goes his whole life wondering if this is the right moment, moment to use the time stop and cheat the devil and I'll never die because I'll be frozen in this moment in time. And the de you know, he goes eventually to his grave having never used it, having never found that perfect moment. I'm like, okay, that's a little bit of a morbid story. Um, he triggers a time stop on the train to hell in order to leverage a buyout from the devil to work as a good doctor. So, I mean, if, not sure if that's slow death, if it's technically perpetually delayed on the train to hell, mm -hmm. but it's a hell of a sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, another type of death that it sounds like we haven't really talked about yet is self-sacrifice. Um, no, I guess we really didn't. Are there? It's, there's so many, so much death. And obviously, that can be handled badly as an easy out. Oh, are there? Really can't. Be. Yes. <laughs> there's a lot of you sacrificing yourself for. Are there examples you have of self self sacrifice we, handled well? Or are we you are technically yourself? out of time. Okay. Uh, we got the room till midnight, so. <laughs> so okay, so 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 do you want to answer that question? Is that it? Self sacrifice as yeah. well. What? So I've done well. Mm -hmm. as, oh, there are probably plenty of. Courts. I I just say, I can't say that I've ever met any people that I can imagine would sacrifice <laughs> sacrifice themselves for me. So it's it's kind of a hard sell for me. I'm just a little confused. Are we allowed to keep talking for a minute? We were just told yeah. by the manager that we can stop. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah. Was that the same hand that was waiting to stop? Yeah, yeah. He's, yes. he's, okay. the, he's the man with the power. He, he is the one person. He, he gave us permission to keep talking. Okay. 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 So so we, we don't have to go to midnight. We, no, we have more questions, sir. We'll answer them. There was a, uh, a character in a book I, I read recently where uh, he'd uh, done a lot of heroic things and all this. And then about three quarters of the way through the book, he was killed. But he was killed because somebody else could not take the time to save him. They had to save somebody else. Do you remember what book this is? Oh, yes, I remember it quite clearly. Uh, Secret War Chronicles, Mercedes okay. Lackey, etc. Okay. The, the whole series. So that, handsome, that turned it into a moral kind of... Handsome Devil. Handsome Devil, Seraphim. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't know I mean, if, if well done is quite the right term, but I think it's so, so differently done that it strikes me uh, death in the King's Horseman. I'm not familiar. Uh, it's a play um, uh, by... Uh, so, uh, so he, uh, um, but yeah, that, that, that uh, the uh, king's right hand man when he dies is obligated to himself commit suicide, and it's a very celebrated thing. Doesn't quite go according to plan, but there is a self sacrifice and death, but it, according to a set of rules that are so kind of different than I think we see in the Western Canada, it's very striking how death is kind of used thematically and it actually. Watchers and You've also got, you know, all the deaths like the Sati and in India, you know, the self domination There's, you know, a lot of um, self sacrifice the Aztec, you know, sacrificing themselves for the sun guys and things. So, some of you weren't necessarily some volunteers. But, you know, that kind of sacrifice, 
Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have been, and she'll always be here. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that was... But he came back. He was a Marvel yeah. dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to take on this. I'm going to go ahead and call it self-sacrifice, except for the very slim uh, minority of cases, just to glorify the plot photo, basically. I'm still relevant, guys. Let me jump in front of this train. Oh right. my god, I couldn't deal with this character otherwise. <laughs> Charles Garden. Yeah. Well while 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 we were while we were going over, we lost most of the audience. So yeah. we, we, thanks all of you for coming. Uh, so Kathy, just to so I thought it was Hi, Jessica. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Nice to meet you, too. I thought that was a good one. You know, I might have been more of an energy. I'm going to do it more. I'm going to do it more. I'm going to do it more. I'm going So we're, just, we're celebrating like good that go. book, and also that's we're celebrating Snow like, um, White Learns Witchcraft, which is my favorite boss. So those are the two that are coming right, out. Right. There's the two available right. on the table. That's a good uh, and it's, like, it's very like, different. Like, wonderful. Like, he's just like, everything that's going on, you know, we're going. Yeah, but uh, was that they... I actually really liked that they killed him. It's supposed to, you know, it's it's like this is the the culmination, right? You, you kill the big bad guy, right? Oh, look. They're still all fucked up. Actually, improved their lives by. I mean, the fact that it happens in the first five minutes of the movie, basically. 